Michael, thank you so much for sharing this film with us today and for sharing your work with the museum. My first question has to do with the agency of objects and that theme of surrogacy that you've already invoked with respect both to the action figure and to the votive objects. In the film, um, Special Ops Cody, acting as a surrogate for Jin, encounters ancient artifacts that stir up haunting memories and flashbacks of uh, what are really traumatic and, and difficult to hear experiences of the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. The unavoidable comparisons, though, between the ancient objects and the present-day people of Iraq are the origin of these flashbacks. And I think that one of the most haunting moments um, for me of the film is when that connection is first being made. You look like them, or they look like you, laying there, Cody observes. It sometimes feels that we in the West are more outraged by the destruction of ancient artifacts and cultural heritage than we are by human suffering and the loss of human lives, that we become numb to the human toll or cost of, of our actions around the world. And your work, and this film in particular, focuses our attention squarely on the human toll, but precisely through ancient objects and through a deeply and duly human and historical awareness that pervades all of your works. Can you speak a little bit more about your understanding of the interconnections between ancient objects and contemporary peoples, between the past and the present? Thank you, Sean, for that wonderful question. Um, yes, it's it's something that I, I think about all the time. Um, I think when it comes to when it comes to, you know, that moment of outrage that I talked about before, that like, you know, the the that the looting of the Iraq Museum, for instance, was one of the first moments of pathos that seemed to have opened up um, during the Iraq War, that it didn't matter if you were for the war or against it, one could agree that this was not simply a localized Iraqi loss, that this was a loss for all of humanity. Um, some of the earliest uh, iterations of urban laws, you know, that were, were in the cuneiform collections and, and primal scenes of human history. Um, and when that outrage about lost objects did not turn into outrage about lost lives, I, 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 I took note of that. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in that, like I, I it, it outrages me, you know, um, but I also think, you know, as somebody who's not a, a psychologist or, or somebody who doesn't totally understand the larger vector of human history and its wholeness, I think that that is one of the things that art allows us to do is to find these indirect vessels for grief um you know and and that um that moment where one has to redirect a what back from the art you know to what's happening in front of them is is a moment then i'm interested in making my work from um so i think it's important that you know that we see these artifacts as something that are not locked into a past but are actually tied to a present and it's tied to a present in very specific ways you know that are concrete that you know if we think about the extraction of a lot of these artifacts that have ended up in our museums collections across the global north and in the west it, it's happened within the last 200 years i mean it's not as though it happened thousands of years ago so these are relatively new moments of extraction and they're usually you know accompanied through a certain kind of atrocity you know that's visited against the people from whom they're extracted from and also the trauma of being parted from that of saying that something is not worth being kept there you know so that's something that i think about as a contemporary trauma because it happens in the same frame as colonial um adventures and rule into places like West Asia and North Africa. Um, and those kinds of connections, you know, I, I can't disaggregate, I can't disentangle them. You know, when I look at something from the palace of Asher Nasser Pal, you know, I'm not just thinking about it in, you know, the eighth century BC, I'm thinking about, you know, it it happening in the you know that palace being something that was that was disassembled and destroyed a second time in the 1840s when it's excavated. 
Um, so those kinds of those kinds of things really do exist side by side for me. I also think that you know when I look at the people that are in these reliefs or I look at the faces that that are on the votive sculptures, I I think very much about how they do represent you know the the people that live there. I think that it's interesting to point out that when I make these artifacts, many of which come from the Neo Assyrian period, I'm making them you know, uh, going to to supermarkets here in Chicago that are run by Assyrian Iraqi families, you know, who have come from the north of Iraq, who have come from places like Mosul or Shaklawa, Dohuk, you know, and, and you know, they, they understand what my studio assistants and I are making and they see themselves in it. So there's a kind of circular ecology that's also very nice that the that the place that we're sourcing the materials from are coming from the descendants of these very people and i think about how those people aren't safe people who look like that you know like the people that are in these reliefs and are in these vitrines are are not you know that they're they're as unsafe as the artifacts themselves you know especially when they come to the west and so i i find myself you know, thinking about all of that in simul, you know, simultaneity. And then the other thing that that I'll say about about the present is just, you know, the way that these come out of the ground is usually monochromatic. You know, it's like Greek sculpture. In this case, you know, the gypsum that the artifacts are made with. You know, they come out brown and uh, they don't disturb you much. You know, they don't have the paint that was on them in antiquity and the West kind of loves that. But in our reappearances in the studio, the color returns, you know, as if uh, blood is once again running through the veins of the figures. Um, but it's also <clears throat> a color that's achieved through, you know, the collaging and the composting of all of these different foodstuffs that are very much a part of survival. You know, so in as much as this is a work that has a kind of mournful quality to it, I insist on this being about the kind of sumud in Arabic or the steadfastness of continuation, you know, that those, those, those culinary traditions, those gathering traditions, the storytelling traditions are not interrupted you know, and that there's still life that's happening, you know, so there's a complexity there, you know, that I, that I try to bring in that is very much about, about, you know, life continuing. So nothing gets locked into the vectors of the past that it's, um, that it's essentially a continuous vector that is not finished. I'm really struck by your use of the ancient Babylonian name um, for, the Ishtar gate in the processional way, you know, that you're incorporating these ancient names into your work. Um, and it makes me think about something that we're dealing with in my department, um, where we have ancient objects that have been given modern names, like Statue of Gudea, for instance, whereas the statue itself in the inscription on it has its own name. It speaks its own name. It says the name of the statue is Gudea, the man who built the house, may his life be long. And somehow in the process of museum taxonomies and cataloging, um, like that has been understood to not be a real name. And he's given a name that, you know, Western museums are more comfortable with, Statue of Gudea. Um, but we're thinking about the importance of giving that statue back its own name putting it on the label that the name of the statue is, in fact, this very long and complex Sumerian name. Um, and I, I'm just wondering how you think of the importance of naming and the importance of letting, letting things have their own complicated, difficult names, um, regardless of how easy the, those are to translate, regardless of how easily or or not those pass through different uh, people's mouths. Thank you for asking a question that nobody has ever asked me. Um, and I've always wanted them to ask me. Um, you know, they, the way that 
uh, I came across that title was visiting the Pergamon Museum um, at the invitation of, um, of an artist. We were both in Berlin at the time. Uh, Gregory Chalette invited me to go and, uh, and see it with him. And, you know, the Pergamon Museum had always been, you know, kind of like self-implicated in its own sort of atrocious history because it's named after the Pergamon altar, which, you know, was excavated, brought to Berlin, but I didn't know that the Ishtar Gate was there. And so when I saw that it too, you know, was existing outside of, a, of where it came from and in Berlin, I was just, I was astonished because I had started reappearing those artifacts. Um, for the, uh, uh, from the Iraq Museum. Um, and, and so when I bought the guidebook and they explained in the guidebook that the Ishtar Gate stood at the center uh, or was like the centerpiece of Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon um, and that the processional way moved through it uh, and that the name of that processional way in Babylonian was Ajibor Shapu, which translates to mean the invisible enemy should not exist. I mean, it was the coolest name of a street that I'd ever heard. It was almost like a Jenny Holzer truism, but it also was like every translation that I've ever heard or I've ever read from like an Arabic song where the music, where the lyrics are so like there's a precision to the lyrics in Arabic that can never be properly translated, but it takes up so much more space to explain it, you know, in, in, in the colonial language of English. Um, and I love that it took up space. It just felt to me like it was pushing back against, you know, occupation, you know, or me, you know, me being somehow parted from the ability to just grow up and learn Arabic as my first language, because, you know, um, that's, that's where, you know, people end up getting separated from their histories in that way. So, so I, I loved, I loved that. Um, and I love that it was unwieldy. I mean, I had galleries saying, can we please shorten the title? It's too much. Like nobody's going to remember it. You know, they're going to be too confused by the title. So I, I, I really, I really appreciated that, that, you know, that the, that there was an inconvenience of too many words. Um, but it was also a ready-made title, you know, and it just felt so poetic, um, you know, to be thinking about uh, what that, that means. Um, I know that there were, that there are two other translations of that same, that same, a uh, street name, that same processional way, which translate into may the obdurate foe not be in good health and may the arrogant not prevail. And they all sound like really beautiful and, um, and kind of ominous pronunciations. Um, and so I, I liked the unwieldiness of it all um, because it's, it felt like decidedly, you know, uh, unable to fit into, you know, the, the container of, um, of Western titles, you know, of untitled even. And so I, I, I think that accuracy is important. You know, I think that the jobs that translators have are, are really, um, tricky, you know, because there's sometimes a desire to, to translate so that it fits, you know, nicely into the container of the language that it's being translated into. Um, but when I work with translators, you know, who who are translating colloquial Arabic from Palestine into English, they maintain that it needs to be presented even with um, the errors that it attains in going from Arabic into English because it's more precise, because English is an inadequate, you know, form in which to understand what, what you're hearing. Um, so it becomes like another battleground in a way. And I think that what you're talking about with the museum is very important that, that we, you know, that you be precise in, in saying that it's not just simply, you know, the statue and its name, 
um, that that the name of the statue comes from an abridged version of of an inscription that now is presented to you as the title that was intended, you know. Um, so I, th I think that that's part of what we're talking about as well, like when we're talking about being a more responsible and responsive museum. as part of the, the caretaking. So Michael, towards the end of the film, Special Ops Cody starts to ask the votive statues, why are you here? Don't y'all want to go home to be free? When the statues don't respond to his attempts to rescue or free them, when they remain silent, the film ends with Cody crossing his arms and standing, it seems, in solidarity with the Mesopotamian votive statues. Can you speak to the symbolism of that moment, that gesture? Well, like you said, it is a gesture of solidarity, you know, of the impossibility of our moment, um, you know, to ask an Iraqi to go home now <clears throat> is one <clears throat> is a is a question that's filled you know with more terror than it is nostalgia you know if we think about you know the aftermath of the Iraq war but also now the corrupt government and the way in which the you know the revolution has been met with such violence you know by the security forces um, you know, but also recognizing, you know, the fact that the statues don't have a voice yet, you know, that I found the voice for Cody, um, you know, but I'm also aware of the fact that, you know, the, the statues don't, don't have the same narrator available to them, that it's always been the Western Museum that's creating a kind of text about them. And so, you know, with the absence of, of the happy ending, you know, what I realize in my relationship with Jin is that, you know, her, her life is built around, you know, the constant navigation of the traumas and the moral injury um, that are associated with her work, her good work as a medic, um, you know, as somebody who was meant to heal um, and, and came back, you know, into a situation where there's an inadequate structure existing that, that can heal her, you know, that it can't. Um, so it was as much about that as it was about, you know, the statues not being able to go home. Um, you know, one of the things that I've started to offer institutions who are asking me to intervene in their collections is, you know, to, to really think about ways in which, you know, something can be done to, to kind of interrupt the cycle you know, of just silence around this idea of whether or not something can go back. And, um, and so, you know, more recently when I've been asked to do things in places where there are Mesopotamian artifacts, is to up the ante, you know, and to say that um, I'll not only show with you, but I'll give this to you if you give back one of your antiquities to Iraq you know, to kind of understand that, you know, that we need to acknowledge the fact that there's an interest in the work that one is doing that's happening in say the contemporary frame, you know, that comes with its own values and its own speculations, um, but also is asking the questions of the museum that's hosting it. And it should not be seen as questions that are just allowing for the institution to say that they've addressed it and can then move on. That if we actually are talking about, you know, the, the question that a lot of museums have about, well, what do we do, you know, with that empty space is I'm offering, you know, a way to fill that empty space 
um, but to also kind of allow for the museums to engage in those conversations that they say that they want to have. Um, and I know exactly how bureaucratically impossible, you know, museums and governments have made restitution for themselves. Um, but that's actually a minefield that I'm interested in dancing in the same way that I was interested in, in performing the impossible task of getting something out of Iraq, like dates. And, um, and so that, that's, that's the kind of that's the kind of system that I'm hoping that I can address, you know, um, and and to make uh, you know clear how it works, you know, by the work that I do, being a kind of coloring agent that can that can illustrate how that system happens, but to also know that it can perhaps be, you know, something that serves as a vehicle for those institutions to find a place to put, you know, some of that um, desire to critically engage with these things. Because, you know, we talked about intergenerational work before, and I'm finding uh, a lot of hope in the courage of younger curators and, and museum workers to actually talk about this stuff rather than than being, you know, the, then, then, then the lot, you know, then having those statues just be silent, you know, that there's, there's a way of offering a kind of, you know, a, a stepping back from the ventriloquy, you know, that the museum seems to offer in, 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 and allowing for another voice, a kind of desire you know, to be spoken through the the object to to potentially return. Michael, thank you so much that I, it's really resonating with me how much you insist on life and connection and um, how people and art are really not, they're inextricable. Um, they don't exist in isolation from each other. And I, I find it really powerful how your work restates that again and again and insists on that living thread. Um, and I also wanna point out, I don't know if it's widely known yet, but there's recent research on the Assyrian reliefs that has indicated that the inscription, the band of inscription across the middle of all the Northwest Palace reliefs, um, the letters were inlaid with a really, really vivid blue pigment called Egyptian blue. So I think that your the the life and the color that you bring to the reliefs, that you and your studio bring to the reliefs, is, I mean, it's in, entirely appropriate. Um, you don't need me to tell you that, but the evidence is there as well that these were vivid neon signs in their day as well. <laughs> um, so I wanna ask you a question that builds on what you've just been talking about um, because you, you are talking about the ways in which objects and people parallel each other. And as you point out, the archeological objects that you're working with um, are in exile, many of them and the people that you work with are in exile and the, the Assyrian grocers that you purchase from are in exile. Um, and this is such a powerful kind of intertwined process that's happening for people and objects. And Sean and I are both really interested in the idea of diaspora as a creative force, as a generative force, as a larger framework for how for how people create a world out of the loss of, of one world. You take, you, everything is lost and you go forward and you make something. Um, and I think we are very interested in asking you what you think of diaspora as a creative force. And do you consider yourself a diasporic artist? Do you consider your art to be diasporic art? To what extent does that resonate for you? Um, 
Thank you so much for that, Sarah. I think, you know, there there's there's precision, you know, that 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 diaspora belongs to that I'm not totally uh, completely in agreement with because, you know, as I'm bringing it up here on my screen, you look up diaspora and, and it immediately talks about the dispersion of the Jewish people beyond Israel, you know, and the origins being from the Greek of dia and across and Greek um, uh, word uh, spira and, you know, for scatter. Um, and I think about you know, that more formally in a way, you know, I can think about the material diaspora of a lot of what I'm engaged with, but then I'm also thinking about, you know, not necessarily, you know, having that word, you know, just come back to one specific scattering of people. Um, so I, I, I'm interested in diaspora because of the impurity that it offers, you know, that it doesn't insist on, you know, the cleanliness of identity, you know, that, that, that can also lead to a kind of purity. You know, I insist on, on you know, something that my, my, um, my mentor, Krzysztof Wodichko, used to say that, like, the question isn't where are you from, it's which where are you from, you know, and, and I think that that has a lot to do with the fact that, like, there's, you know, that we take on all of those places that our ancestors have been when we come into our own bodies. It becomes part of what we consider to be the all of ourself. Um, and so, you know, for me, you know, diaspora, um, you know, could have meant, um, you know, engaging with my Hungarian and Eastern European roots on my father's side of the family, but it was brought more intimately into my life because I grew up in my grandparents from uh, in, in there. I grew up in the house of my grandparents from Iraq, or my mother's parents. And so that was what was there. You know, that was the intimacy and the transmission and, and everything else. Um, but it's also distinctly, you know, American in a lot of ways. Um, you know, that that is a kind of story. And that's complicated, you know, because that's built on top of chattel slavery and chattel slavery happens on top of, of uh, indigenous dispossession and genocide, you know, so um, it's a gen it, it's a kind of it's a diaspora existing on top of so many other diasporas, you know. And so when I think about what we do as a kind of land acknowledgement these days, um, you know, which I think is a very important practice because it forces us to reckon with things we haven't reckoned with in the United States, um, is that it, it it ends up being a kind of essential you know, in, introspection into like the core sample, you know, of who we are, um, why we're here, where we came from, and what do we displace by being here? You know, so I think about all of those things together. And I think about my family's own dispossession, you know, that like literally, if I think about the root cause of why my, my grandparents left Iraq, it was the event that was called the Farhud, which were these anti-Jewish riots that happened in June of 1941. Um, and the Arabic, the Iraqi Arabic translation is for Farhu is violent dispossession. You know, so my grandparents, you know, like I, I wish, I wish I had been old enough to have the sense to ask them these things when they were still alive. I mean, they both died when I was very young. Um, but to ask them you know, what, how did they navigate the tragedy of being told that they didn't belong anymore? You know, that they couldn't be Iraqi and that they were not considered to be Arab essentially because Arab nationalism emerges the same time as Zionism, you know, largely, you know, in conflict with one another. And my grandparents considered themselves Arab. They considered themselves Baghdadi, you know, before anything else, you know, but sudden, suddenly it was a world to which they could no longer belong. 
you know, but they came to the United States and they were adamant about holding on to those traditions, you know, and, and I've talked about this before where I consider my grandparents to be the first installation artists that I ever met. Because when I was in that house, when I grew up in that house, you know, it's like everything that's on the floors is from Iraq. Everything that's on the walls is from Iraq. You know, what's coming out of the stereo during the family festivals and the belly dancers arrive was, was from Iraq. And what was coming out of the kitchen was most definitely from Iraq. You know, it was like, wow, you know, my grandparents were able to cast an entire house in the smell of cumin, you know. Um, and it seems to me that one of the things that the the project of America encourages everyone to do is to not see themselves as diaspora, right? To see themselves as this new thing where you give up all this stuff that you're traveling with to take on something new. And my grandparents didn't do that. And I think it must've been really hard, you know, to come from a place that tells you you don't belong anymore, but to still maintain that they do belong. And that they're gonna to continue to speak the Arabic. They're gonna to continue to make the food. They're gonna to continue to listen to the music, you know? And I think for them, if I can project onto them a little bit, I think they knew that it was a moment you know, that it wasn't forever, that it was like also not a monolithic decision by all of Iraqi society, you know, that it was a political moment in the history of a place that they belonged to, that their family belonged to for thousands and thousands of years, you know, that they, they saw as a kind of temporary interruption, you know? So as I think about myself as diaspora, I also think about myself as somebody who's been interrupted um, and I'm doing what I can to kind of make sure that that exists as something that is only an interruption and not a total um, departure. Um, but I think it's important to keep, you know, some of those things alive in one's work, you know, that like I believe in keeping the traces of the problems and failures alive in artwork. Um, and so I think that I make that clear in a lot of ways of saying that like, you know, that there's, there's something that happens when you make, you know, when you think somehow that logically the best way to bring a Lama Su back to life is to make it out of 10,500 Iraqi date syrup cans. I think that has to do with missing Iraq. You know, I don't know that the same material culture decision would be made from somebody who's living inside of their rock, you know? So it becomes that longing in a way, right? It's also a Warhol moment, you know, in artwork, you know, where it's like, I, I thought about the Campbell soup can when I was doing that, but really as an afterthought. Um, so I would, I would say that I engage with diaspora. I'd never wanted to say I'm any one kind of artist, um, but I unflinchingly, put it in there. And when I think about the agreement that I came to with the Tate Modern about the, um, the custodianship of the Lamasu, you know, that it, it for, for the very reasons that I'm interested in restitution and the very reasons that I'm interested in relationships of reciprocity versus like a Western idea of conservation as a form of almost colonialism, you know, that the, that the work has to be shared with an Iraqi institution is I very much see that work as an embodiment, as a votive of Iraqi, uh, Iraqi diaspora, where so much of the country now, because of the succession of wars and occupation and extraction, so much of that country exists outside of its own borders. You know, and so I wanted that Lamasu that already has wings you know, to be going between two places, like a diasporic artwork, so that it can keep those tensions alive. There's no full happy ending here. You know, it will always be a ghost and it will decide who needs to be haunted. Michael, I, I love your use of the word interruption um, to, to sort of speak about diaspora and your your experience of diaspora i think it's a wonderful metaphor for for what diaspora is an interruption um in one's state of being in one's home um and you know as you were speaking 
it brought to mind to me the fact that within the study of diaspora, there's a very interesting, um, there's a lot of attention given to what might be considered the third generation phenomenon. Um, and that, that is that the, the first generation of diasporans sort of n always maintain their Iraqiness or, or their Africanness or their um, um, Chicano identity. Um, on, it's the second generation who um, takes that for granted and maybe makes moves towards the, the new identity of the new homeland in which they find themselves. And it's the third generation as, as it gets, as those ties begin to get strained that sometimes takes a more, it, diaspora lives and dies with that third generation in a way. Um, as the, the ties become more strained, um, they often take a more generative or creative approach. And I wonder if that resonates with you. I, 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 I don't want to project on you, but I'm curious if, if you find yourself doing that in your work. I appreciate that a lot, Sean. Um... I'm not familiar with the third generation phenomenon, um, but I completely understand it. You know, I get that a lot. Um, I mean, I, I understand it quite clearly because I do think that 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 it's something where uh, you know maybe it's like just all of the intergenerational data, you know, that starts to kind of emerge in the body that makes people you know question who they are and 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 why they're in that place at that very moment um one of my best friends is this wonderful two-spirit artist um m carmen lane um who is living and working in cleveland and carmen is um is black and also of tuscarora and mohawk uh heritage and we talk about, I mean, we talk about interruption. Carmen has brought up the word interruption in relationship to, um, in 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 relationship to to blackness, in relationship to uh, indigeneity, but also just, you know, the work that people who are inside those bodies have to do constantly, over and over again. You know that. Um, more or less is like a continuous colonization of time, right? Um, and when I think about the work that Carmen does and the work that we talk about doing together, um, I think very much about the fact that, that, that in their work, um, they're bringing a lot of that information in as a kind of as a, a subsequent generation, um, you know, as somebody who's on that trajectory of history, you know, but appreciating the objects from the past, um, the ideas from the past, and realizing that this word past tends to locate things a little too politely in a place where they can't any longer be potent. You know, and that's what the vitrine does also, right? Like, you know, it takes the useful object and make, renders it useless in a lot of ways. And so I think that there's a desire to look back at these things, not as antiques, but as things that can be wielded in the present. Um, and so, you know, I think that in a lot of ways, you know, it, it's interesting to think about it, like as, as an object relationship, right? You know, that like, uh, you know, my mother, for instance, has the mortar and the pestle that my grandfather used to make date syrup. And it's made out of stone. It's amazing. Um, and uh, when I was doing the cookbook, you know, that the, the fourth plinth project ended up being a cookbook of all these date syrup recipes by 41 chefs around the world, including my mother. My mother took the mortar and the pestle and she used it, you know, since my grandfather died, it's been kind of a memorial, you know, but then she used it and something, something happened, right? Like there was this, uh, you know, this moment where the thing became located in the present and not always in the past. And, and I, I think about that a lot with Iraq, you know, that like um, Iraq should not have to only be humanized through its past. 
you know, that uh, there's, there's people like Dr. Nala Shabut, for instance, an art historian who has worked tirelessly to make present the contemporary and modern Iraqi art that's being made. Um, the modern masterpieces that were lost during the 2003 invasion that not enough people know about. You know, so I think about, I think about the work of that third, third generation, if I'm getting it right, you know, to, to do things to bring the past and the present a little bit closer to each other, you know, so, so that it can exist, you know, on a timeline that, 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 that's more proximate, you know, that there can be a verticality to the timeline where things are happening simultaneously throughout history, as opposed to something, you know, being politely located in a place where it can't offer anything critical anymore. Um, and I think this is what happened to me, actually. I know one of your questions was probably going to be about like my experience in museums, you know, but I think it's a, an important point to bring up now because when I was, when I was a kid, when I was 10, my grandmother died in the house that she and my grandfather moved to when they left their office. <clears throat> and we had planned to go to London, um, you know, a couple of months afterwards to go and visit her brother um, when he left there off, he and his family moved there. And we decided to keep with the trip, you know, to, to do it because it was a way of grieving in a manner that, um, that allowed for us to commune with another ancestor somebody who grew up with my grandmother who could tell the same stories about Baghdad from another perspective. And we can engage with, with living, you know, continuation. And on that trip, my mother took us all to the British Museum. And it was almost like radar. She knew exactly where to go. She led us through the Great Hall and right to the Assyrian rooms. And I found myself in that room with the lion hunt of Ashurbani Pal. And she sat me and my brothers down on the bench in front of it. And she was explaining, you know, that all of this, all the panels are sequential. You know, they show a different scene that's happening as a progression of time. And that in effect, this sequential art was the first comic book in human history. And it came from the same place that she and my grandmother were from. And I, you know, like when you're 10 years old, there's nothing cooler than seeing the first comic book of human history and realizing that your people are responsible for it. Um, and then she turned to us and she said, and what is it doing here in London? And at that moment, I immediately understood <laughs> that I wasn't simply in like some place that was politely presenting these examples of history to me so I could learn you know, so I could update myself, you know, what it means to be human, that these were things that were, that were in a lot of cases being held hostage. And so it changed my relationship to museums. I mean, I feel very lucky that my mother was my first sort of like, uh, you know, decolonial guide, um, you know, through a museum. But in that moment, you also recognize the fact that like, that these objects are dispersed just like you are, you know, and it makes you kind of realize that that these these things happen together, these moments happen together. Um, that the dispersal of people and the dispersal of the objects themselves share timelines as well. I love how you're talking about impurity and about impoliteness and these aspects of your work. And I find that so generative as, you know, impurity is absolutely a generative thing. Nothing that is pure and sterile can grow. So um, it makes me think a lot about your work um, in two different ways that I wanna ask you to speak more about. So number one is the multi-generational aspect of how you see yourself and your work as situated on this continuum where you're, in dialogue with both your distant ancestors, the votive sculptures that you 
so beautifully are bringing to life in a way that is completely, completely resonant and meaningful um, with what we know about them archaeologically. And your more recent ancestors, your grandmother, um, and then thinking about your connections with the future. Um, I have to mention that my children really loved watching the Ballad of Special Ops Cody. And I think that that kind of leads into the next um, thread that I want to pick up, which is that you're, you're working in materials that are not in any way inaccessible or um, elevated. You're working in, in food packaging. These are things that are accessible to everyone and um, including children. And I find that in contemporary art, you know, children are very rarely thought of, um, but I do see in your work um, a, a humanity that includes children in the audience for art and that takes them seriously as people who might look at and engage with what you're making. And the story that you told about going to the British Museum at the age of 10 and engaging with the lion hunt of Ashurbanipal, I think really makes it clear to me that as a young person, you engaged with art, and so you respect young people's ability to engage with your art. But I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit more about how you see yourself on this multi-generational continuum and how you think about the materials that you're using and their relevance to, um, to a variety of people there. They, they don't put, put up any barriers to access is what I'm thinking. And I'd like you to talk a little more about that, if you could. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, for me, um, art is one of those things that luckily I felt as though I had access to because the way my parents essentially introduced it to me, um, the way they narrated it for, for me at those very early um, uh, ages. And given all that, I still get uncomfortable, you know, being inside contemporary art spaces sometimes that are just so sterile and pure. Um, you know, there's something about the white wall um, and the white cube in and of itself that that makes me uncomfortable. And, and I think that, you know, all of that, all of that can be probably easily understood, you know, um, vis-a-vis -vis the art that I make and also the fact that um, that I come to everything that I'm doing as a public artist. Um, you know, the work that I do in public space is not, um, you know, completely dissociated from what I'm doing uh, in museums, you know, that I see as something that should be an extension of public space. Um, and when I, when I work, on projects, I'd like to think of it less as something that can just be easily designated as art, but as something that can enter into the public consciousness as something where somebody isn't even aware of the fact that it's art. You know, when I did the project that essentially was a trigger for all of this work, where I reopened my grandfather's company. Um, his import export company to import Iraqi dates to the US for the first time in 40 years. You know, that was done not as something where people were told before they came in through the door that this is just an art project. I mean, it was a storefront on Atlantic Avenue uh, in the heart of New York City, City's Arab community um, and presented itself as being a place that was going to import Iraqi dates. And in fact, it was. Um, you know, whether or not it lands on everybody as an art project, uh, to me is secondary. In fact, I prefer work that can be a bit more insurgent and enter into life and continue, you know, what was being talked about by the artists that I idolize, you know, about like where there's a real blurring between the boundaries of art and life. Um, you know, so there's, there's, there's that. I think that um, also I I just think that I I've always had these intergenerational dialogues available to me and my family and even though I lost my grandparents at an early age and made enough of an impact and my mother was included in that trajectory 
you know, so her always being present when my grandparents were part of that conversation made it so that those conversations could continue so that that appreciation could continue. And one of the things that I do love about, you know, the, the vanguard and about, um, about, about contemporary art and, and the birth of so much of its thinking, you know, with things like the ready-made, for instance. I mean, it's, it is about dislodging, you know, the work of art or the work of culture from a moment of preciousness and exclusivity and scarcity. Um, and it pushes against what we know is a kind of market economy, you know, that tends to define our lives. So the idea that something could simply be replicated you know, um, and mimicked, you know, if you like that thing, is something that I adore, you know. Um, I think about that a lot. I also think it's one of the reasons why I insist on having multiple hands in my studio, is that these are impossible tasks for me to take on on my own. And I love the fact that these works that were very much about, like, these, these cities, you know, from a long time ago, you know, it was a city that actually had to make all these objects in the first place. And there's a reflective moment in the way that they're made here. So it takes away the preciousness of this being one person's hand. In fact, all of those votive sculptures were made out of different hands. And these, you know, these, these reliefs behind me were made by different hands, you know. So I, I think for me that that's an important, that was an important moment for me when I, when, when I started to kind of, kind of understand art history um, through the lens of modernity, you know, was the fact that that when when my mother told me about Warhol saying that everybody could be an artist, you know, or Yoko Ono saying the same thing, it didn't land on me as something that was just being said. You know, it meant that it was true, um, and I tried to hold that out as much as I can in the way that I operate in the world in the way that I engage my audiences, which is that like, you know, this is, this is possible, you know, that these kinds of, of materials that I'm using point to an urgency, but they also point to something that everybody has, um, you know, a kind of experience with when I think about the, Iraqi community, or I think about the Arab American community. Um, you know, I, I just, uh, you know, there's a certain point. I mean, I love your question because it's really throwing me off. You know, it's, it's a little bit like a psychoanalysis because it's making me think about all of those things that never jived well with me. You know, like theory in graduate school, you know, I tried so hard to be a fan of it. You know, it's like some somebody saying, this is the best record ever. You're going to love this. And you realize like, no, it's not. You know, I like my grandparents, they're all music better or whatever. You know, like I just, all of all the way in which the formula of art making and art viewing and art appreciation tends to kind of, you know, uh, create itself and recreate itself, you know, and I'm supposed to sort of conform to that was not something that I could ever get down with. There were things that I loved. I loved Deleuze and Guattari and, and some of those things that were really messy. But I think because they kind of like, they were approaching things more as amateurs, you know, as things that involved amor, of love, you know, um, of loving an idea and you can sense it. Um, you know, so I think ultimately, you know, like when I think about this work that I'm doing and like we're talking about archives, we're talking about index, we're talking about, um, we're talking about the arrangement of information. And so some of the people that come into this field of archeology span and art spends a lot of time in libraries and will look up at shelves of books and be in awe. <laughs> when I think about my work, I don't see the library, I see the pantry. Right, I see all of the colorful packages of the baharat, of, of the rice, of all of the ingredients that my grandmother had in that pantry. And when I was a small person looking up at it and seeing all of that hot pink and all that wild green and everything else, like that's what's in my work, you know, but I don't think that that's necessarily 
you know, any less than, than the great libraries in history. I wonder if I could ask a follow-up to that, Michael, um, because one of the things that strikes me is it's, it's not just the humble and accessible materials that your work is made out of, um, but it's also the fact that so many of your projects involve a very human element, um, particularly in community and individual collaborators who are not necessarily artists themselves. And I wonder if you would talk a little bit about why that spirit of collaboration is so important to you and to your work. I think it's because I, you know, the, I, I'm genuinely drawn to those, to those stories and to those people. Um, you know, for instance, you know, a project like the one that I did in Philadelphia with mural arts that's called Radio Silence. Um, you know, they asked me to conceive of a, a site specific public art project for Philadelphia. And I stumbled across a story about this man named Bajat Abdul Wahed, who was the Walter Cronkite of Iraq, was one of the most popular broadcasters, and it ended up as a refugee with his wife Haifa in um, in Philadelphia. And you know, I don't think that that it was predictable for Bajat to be the subject of an art project, you know. But I started to think about just the the way in which his voice in and of itself is this, this undeniable work of culture, you know, that ends up narrating Eroch's modernity, um, you know, being on the airwaves from like the 1950s up until the, the late 1980s. Like it was very much, you know, something that I, that was like a, an experience of popular culture that I wish I had in my life, you know, if my grandparents hadn't had to depart that I wanted to engage with, but I also want to engage with his craft, you know, with what it is that he does in the world. And I, I think about my work as just, you know, that's what I do in the world, but I'm attracted to what other people do in the world, you know, whether it's singing or being a broadcaster or being an archeologist or an importer exporter, like though I get attracted to a lot of those stories that people tell, you know, and I get attracted to, you know, there's certain kinds of stories I get attracted to, but I also um, very much enjoy sitting with people and hearing, you know, from them. Um, so, you know, I, 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 for me, I, I think that the work that I create is oftentimes trying to dislodge or decenter, you know, uh, you, you know, the, it, it coming back to one central artwork, you know, that it's about, it is about, um, you know, communities. And when I think about art, I much prefer to think about art as culture. And when I think about culture, I think about, you know, what it means to have societies. And when I think about societies, I think about cities. And when I think about cities, you know, I think I'm left in those places like where the primal scene of those cities is maybe in those artifacts, you know, but more recently I was introduced to the fact that you know, um, in Michael Pollan's Omnivore's Dilemma, which came out in the early 2000s, he talks about how cities formed when people decided to cook together. You know, so I'm immediately brought back to the kitchen. And that was where I was all the time, right? In my grandparents' house. And so it's become a big part of my work, the cooking. You know, but there's, again, like a psychoanalytic thing, you know, of like not knowing exactly why I'm doing this, but when I read that part of, of Michael Pollan's book and I realized that, you know, I started out, you know, doing a lot of work about architecture and public space, um, that it, it made sense that I was cooking, you know, where the building essentially disappears and it's about the people that are inside the building and why people would decide to, you know, to be living next to one another.
you know, so I, I think, I think in a lot of ways, you know, what I get interested in, you know, is, is making work that reflects, you know, the way that culture happens and culture happens when people come together, you know, it's never one person. Um, you know, everything I'm talking to you about today has been sculpted by conversations that I've had, you know, not only with you, but also with everybody that I've had up to this point, you know? So I try to make work that somehow reflects that. And I think that I'm also interested in like what, what Sarah was talking about before, of dislodging it from a place that, <clears throat> that it can't be accessed and creating more moments of access that are like, intergenerational, you know, that it's not just, you know, a singular experience for a certain kind of age group, that it can be intergenerational, you know. Um, I don't know if that's a satisfying answer, but but that's what I've got. You know, I, I have to tell you, as you're speaking, I keep thinking of the banquet stele of Asher Nasirpal. Um, and he, so at some point, I, I'm gonna say this for the audience, I'm not going to assume that this isn't something you know, but um, at some point in the construction of the Northwest Palace, they decided that it was time to consecrate the building and they had a huge party that lasted for well over a week. They invited over 60,000 people and they were people who had worked on the palace. They were, you know, everyone who kept the palace running, the, the citizens of Nimrud and he, fed them, he gave them things, wonderful things to drink. And he says, and I bathed them and sent them back to their homes in, in joy. And um, as you're talking, I keep thinking about that party at Nimrud um, in almost 3000 years ago. And I, I feel that you are working in that lineage, that what you're doing is speaking to that across time. So I have to bring it up because it's it's in my head as you're speaking. You're bringing it back to life. Well, well, I, I hope to be a more a more uh, altruistic human than Asher Nasirpal. Um, but um, yeah, I love I love I love the banquet stele because it is very much about um, you know that moment where there is that intersection between hospitality and hostility and of course you know i've spoken about this so much so i i apologize if i'm repeating myself but like hospice and hostis the roots of those words you know are related to the guest you know but they also mean the stranger or the enemy you know and so like where the host comes from uh also like the etymology it shares the etymologies of words like hostage you know so you know, like that, that, that moment of welcoming in the palace, you know, is paradoxical because it's also accompanied by the standard inscription, you know, on these in cuneiform, which is like Ashurnasirpal, king of Assyria, king of the world, stepped on the necks of his foes, had the heads of his enemies piled up like towers. You know, it really is like, um, you know, like a boast, like a, a, a you know, WrestleMania boast. Um, but I, um, I do think that, you know, there's, there's aspects to, you know, the culture that I grew up in, which was really based on that about like, you know, sharing the delight of things, you know, not it not being a kind of private, singular thing, I could never understand, you know, it, it's one of the reasons I guess I can't understand, you know, the, the American obsession with wealth, you know, which, which really seems so uh so atomic and 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 singular and individual i mean it really you know is for me like these things are be be to be enjoyed together um you know it's much more interesting to hear the music coming out of a car uh that's passing than to know that it's happening in somebody's earbuds on on their own so i I appreciate you you bringing that that up because it it is one of those things that I think about when I'm when I'm when I'm reappearing these things with my studio is that 
these all had a kind of communal function, you know, that these, these votives even were about a kind of communal um, act of worship, that even though they were surrogates for the individual, they could be surrogates for anyone. Um, you know, they didn't have to exactly look like you. Um, so it, it, it's, you know, it, it does kind of, it does kind of, you know, really dovetail with that, that, that ethos that I try, you know, to have in my work. Um, and I think, again, it's lived experience, you know, it's recognizing the fact that every time that I'm, that I'm, that I'm in places like Amman, you know, or in Bethlehem, or in Ramallah, you know, I'm being invited, you know, to people's homes with other people, you know, that I'm, when I go to Philadelphia, and I meet with the Iraqi community there, you know, it's with everyone, you know, and, and so I appreciate that a lot. And that's one of the sad things I think about, you know, ownership when it comes to art is that it's very often, you know, um, a question of like, who's looking at it. And when we talked a little bit earlier about accessibility to art, um, and like, you know, making it so that kids can enjoy it. Um, you know, that it really is also about how do we make the museum that everyone feels welcome into? You know, how do we create those spaces? And I, 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 I appreciate the question because it, it kind of, you know, puts the finger on the work that I'm trying to do. Um, yeah. Michael, I wonder if I could pick up very briefly on that question of hope, because um, as I was reading uh, the Nasher Prize brochure, uh, which you were just awarded this year um, and which only recently came out, it really struck me when one of the jurors described your work as being about healing and about how to take the problem of cultural destruction and turn that into a resource for a very optimistic vision and reconstruction of our society. And I think for me that really resonated because I've found your work simultaneously um, deeply troubling and challenging and also inspiring of hope. And so I guess my question to you is, um, in this moment in time, it feels like we face so many uphill, uphill battles uh, here at home, bureaucratically within our institutions and across the globe. The odds can seem really stacked against us. Should we be optimistic? Um, how do you wrestle with that tension uh, between um, deep trauma and pessimism, but also hope for the future? Uh, and, and I'm thinking particularly of a project like The Invisible Enemy, for which I think we all recognize there's no clear end in sight for that, no happy, happy finish line at the horizon. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I appreciate I appreciate what you're saying. Um, one thing that that I've spoken about with Carmen a lot is the fact that healing, you know, is, is a nice thing to engage in, but it often hurts more than the wound. Um, it, you know, that that ability to see that it's that it's deeply troubling, you know, simultaneous to it being something that's generative. I mean, an object is being made in the end. Um, you know, harkens back to also just culinary experience, you know, that um, that Iraqi cooking is built around this idea of hamud helu, sweet and sour, you know, and the idea is that if you have, you know, for instance, uh, um, a, a kubba dumpling that you're making, you know, if, if that is made with sweet spices, um, that your that your stew that you're cooking it in should be bitter. So those flavor flavors are held in a moment of tension, and um, and vice versa. And so, you know, I I I I think about you know something in work 
you know, that that moment where something is troubling in work, that that can be like enzymatic, you know, that it can be like the enzymes that change a protein, you know, that allows for spoiled milk to become cheese or something. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I, I have to admit that I probably am more optimistic than I am pessimistic. I think it has something to do with being a parent. You know, when you're a parent, you kind of, you kind of make an anchor in the future and you, I, I don't find that I have a choice, right? And, um, you know, but I also know from the people that I work with, you know, that some of them are just so happy to be alive. And I can't allow for the cynicism and the pessimism that I feel at times to override me because I feel like that's a privilege, you know, to be pessimistic as a certain kind of privilege that I, as an Arab Jew, you know, who has given birth to another generation, I can't afford to have that. And so, um, you know, so I think I am actually deeply, I, I myself am sculpted, you know, by, by the experiences that I have with my collaborators, you know, of working with, with people that have come out of these situations and still insist on surviving, you know? Um, and I can't say that I ever set out to heal in the work that I do. You know, but I do set out to host. And I grew up around, you know, the best and most courageous hosts I could ever have in my mother's family, you know. Um, and and I think that's all that I can that I can hope to do. So I have one last question, and then we'll turn to our audience to continue the Q&A. For those of you at home, if you have any burning questions, now would be a good time to enter those into the Q&A feature on your screen. Your questions will be visible only to those of us on screen and not to your fellow attendees. Michael, I want to pick up on something you just mentioned about uh, trying to create the museum that's welcoming to everyone, um, which is work that I think we're all uh, pressingly engaged in, um, artists, uh, curators alike. Um, Special Ops Cody and Works from the Invisible Enemy Project have already fostered some really wonderful and critical conversations in our galleries about the relationship and responsibilities of America and Americans towards Iraqi cultural heritage. Curators and museums are uh, responsible for caring for that cultural heritage, but should this caretaking be the sole responsibility of these institutions? Can you envision a way to bring in communities that are not currently given privileged access to Iraqi cultural heritage? And as we go about this business of caring for the past, what can we do to be shaping a, a better present? Well, thank you for that, that inspiring, courageous question. Um, it's something that I think about a lot, um, you know, First off, you know, I do think that there are exemplary organizations like the Narain Network that Dr. Eleanor Robeson um, is involved with um, uh, through uh, University College of London and, um, and also a lot of the relationships that have been built up through the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago in engaging with fellow archeologists and academics at places like the National Museum of Iraq and throughout the, the country. Um, you know, for me, I think that museums should be willing to listen to publics that are outside of their direct publics. Um, I think that when it comes to these objects that are in collections, you know, that we need to first kind of understand why the museum is there in the first place. And one of the things that I've recognized in my own life with my own sweet and sour relationship to museums, um, thinking back to that experience in the British Museum, 
and being so grateful that I was in front of the lion hunt of Asher Bani Pal, but also feeling the sting, you know, that it was not where it came from. Um, you know, I think that we need to work to make what we consider to be encyclopedic museums, something that operate on a relationship of mutuality um, and reciprocity. And that is something that I think, you know, needs to be in that conversation about, you know, what it means to have a, a, a collection that engages with accountability and questions around restitution and questions around deep colonization. I want to be led in those conversations by people who are from those places or exist in those places. Um, I want, you know, to, to not have the conversation happening uh, from the West and from the global North and directed elsewhere. I mean, that's very much the conversation about, uh, that. that's how the conversation around conservation has happened. You know, so I would encourage those voices to be brought in um, first and foremost. Um, I also believe that when we talk about decolonization and restitution and repatriation, that, that we need to be careful that those conversations don't become as easy as apology. Um, apology is often, you know, offered with good intentions, but the way that it operates is usually to unburden the person who's delivering the apology rather than to truly heal the person who's receiving it. And what I like to think of beyond apology, you know, is uh, rest, restoration. You know, like when we talk about restorative justice, I think about the way in which that as a practice is, is truly um, helpful because it's ongoing work. It doesn't necessarily always, it doesn't necessarily end. Um, you know, people have to commit to it. And, and so I think about restoration also being part of that conversation in museums, that every museum that I know of has a restorer. Um, and if we can engage in a kind of restoration of the object, as opposed to just something that's simple, you know, where things need to be given back, they should be given back, but there should be a dialogue that follows, that continues, because that relationship is forever, you know, it's been taken from one place, brought to another, and, uh, you know, the issue doesn't end with some kind of polite return, to use that word again. Um, so, you know, I think that we need, we need to, um, to understand that there isn't, that, that there probably will be directives that are developed, you know, as a kind of best practices. But I think we need to look at the human relationships also beyond those best practices. I think that's one of the ways in which museums can actually make people feel welcome. Because if I think about myself being one of those bodies that's been displaced from one of those places, I never truly feel like those objects are actually, you know, there for me. <laughs> um, and, you know, but I also um, think that we need to bring a little bit more into the foreground those conversations that I know a lot of museums are having with their colleagues in places like Iraq and in Syria. Like that should be some of the front of the house um, uh, explanation as opposed to it just existing as some kind of program. I love the idea of an encyclopedic museum uh, that comes from a, a, a real mutual curiosity about one another, you know, but we also have to face it that the encyclopedic museum begins as a kind of imperial entity. And most encyclopedic museums are located in the global north and in the west. And so if I think about, you know, you know the kind of surprises we might come across in those conversations, if we truly have them, that if, if a culture feels as though they're, they're, you know, we know in archaeology 
that there is the existence of partage, you know, that like when things have been excavated with teams together from the US and Iraq and places and during times like the 1950s, that there was always so much that the country felt as though it was comfortable giving something up, you know? But what about getting something back? You know, like, I mean, I brought this up to the BBC ones when they were talking about my Lama Sioux in Trafalgar Square, hinting at the fact that the ones in the British Museum should be given back. And I said, what makes you think that the Iraqis don't want something of yours? You know, what if you were having to give up something of Stonehenge? And the guy was like, that'll never happen, you know? And I love that anger. And I love that that kind of like that moment of incredulity because that, that shows you exactly who you're dealing with. That shows you the power that you're dealing with. You know, so instead of there just being the predictable conversation about things going back, and if if people want them back, they should get them back. Um, I'd like there to also be a moment where the countries that are being talked about have the agency to speak for themselves. You know, and to actually talk about how their own curiosity in the culture of the world is alive and well. You know, one of the things that got talked about a lot um, during the Iraq war was, was about the popularity of American pop music, um, you know, which shouldn't be so strange to people, you know, but it, it, when you presume that people from places like Iraq are not existing on your own, on the same timeline, and that the only thing that they are interested in is antiquity, you're participating in that kind of colonial oppression of locating those people only to the past. So it's a messy answer to your question, you know, but I do think that, you know, the, the most important thing is I want to be led by the people that we're talking about, you know, and your museum in Bowdoin has a local audience, but because of everything that's in your collection, you actually have a global audience. And that has to be acknowledged. And it's not just the Bowdoin, it's every museum that operates in that way um, that, that, that needs to, I think, acknowledge that and, and to, find, to find ways of engaging those, those audiences that you know, are sp spoken about in the halls of the museum um, but they're rarely, you know, present.